This is CBC Here and Now. A Newfoundland mother says a foreign soldier sucker punched her son in Alberta. He died three days later and she's still waiting for answers. I will see justice served. I won't stop. Big change is happening here at this intersection at Rollins Cross. I'm Jeremy Eaton and I'll show you what's going to be different coming up on here. Good evening, I'm Anthony Germain. And I'm Carolyn Stokes. We begin with a loss for Trump and a big win for the mill in Cornerbrook. Local politicians celebrating after a ruling today overturned U.S. tariffs on Canadian newsprint. With reaction tonight here and now as Colleen Connors joins us live from Cornerbrook. Colleen? Well, it looks like the last mill in this province is safe for another day and shining bright in the sunshine here this evening. The International Trade Commission overturned those hefty tariffs, freeing up the mill. And, you know, talking with the mayor, Jim Parsons, here in Cornerbrook today, he congratulated the company that owns the place, Kruger, saying that they did very well in handling themselves over these past few months. Uh, you know, they didn't panic. Uh, the union didn't panic. Uh, everyone sort of just said, okay, what do we have to do next? And uh, they looked for a new market, found new shipping methods, uh, in, you know, improved how they did things. And uh, again, uh, in order to make uh, the product at Cornerbrook viable, and uh, they did just that. Uh, this is really a, uh, a bonus. Uh, it gets us back to even. Uh, in terms of the tariff. As I understand it, the monies collected get uh, refunded back to the company. Uh, so uh, all in all, I think uh, it's, uh, it's great news and it's, uh, it's time to move on and let's get, let's get back to business. Now, all of this started back in January when the U.S. Department of Commerce imposed that 9% duty on all the Canadian newsprint exported to the U.S. The, the total went up in March to 32%. That's the highest duty of any mill in Canada. Now, Kruger and this mill, well, they were greatly affected by this. The company laid off 12 employees as a result. And the Cornerbrook Pulp and Paper Mill would have lost, get this, $30 million a year to those tariffs. But the province did fought, fight back, spending $700,000 in legal fees, which it won't get back. And as the Mayor Parsons says, you know, all this hard work is paying off and the tariffs are eliminated, possibly saving about 5,000 jobs in and around the city of Cornerbrook. If we can withstand, I guess, such a blow to our core business, our core export industry here in Cornerbrook. Uh, it should provide a lot of confidence to businesses here and businesses thinking of coming here that uh, the West Coast and Cornerbrook in particular is very strong and uh, we have a very strong base to build upon. We're adding new uh, government facilities and buildings every day. Uh, there's a number of new businesses starting here and now the mill is back in full force. It's time to get uh, to, get to work and uh, build our economy. And about half of the newsprint that's produced here at this mill goes to the U.S. every year. That's 120,000 tons and $85 million worth of paper. Live in Cornerbrook, I'm Colleen Connors for Here and Now. A Premier Dwight Ball was front and center in fighting Trump's tariffs. As Colleen mentioned, the province spent over $700,000 on legal fees in this trade battle. We'll have Anthony's conversation with the Premier in about 20 minutes. Well, some St. John's residents are now schlepping their drinking water from a Phillips station on Blackler Avenue. This comes after the city identified high levels of manganese in some of the city's water yesterday. Here now's Ryan Brockerville reports. The city made this water station available after yesterday's late announcement that over 10,000 residents on over 250 streets in the central and western parts of St. John's could be affected by high levels of manganese in their water. Now, manganese is naturally occurring, but can cause neurological and cardiovascular problems when levels get too high. But one local resident seems fine with getting his water here while the city works on the issue. I would imagine they'll get it fixed, so, you know, uh, I'm not going to start complaining yet. So. The challenge for the city is, is that it doesn't know where or why the manganese is showing up in such high levels of concentration. They've hired experts, but there's no timetable for a fix. For now, the city says that if your water is dark in color, don't drink it. If it's clear, you're fine. If you need to pick up water, you need to bring your own container. Ryan Brockerville, CBC News, St. John's. Now, just a few minutes ago, the city held a news conference about this water problem, and one of the questions that was asked was, 
where is the manganese coming from? Manganese is uh, coming from the source water at Petty Harbor Long Pond. It's also being um, deposited in the distribution system. So as the water moves through the distribution system, it is picking up additional manganese in certain areas, which is why one section of a street may have discolored water and another section may be clear. So it's sporadic in nature. So how are you going to fix that? So our short-term solution is we are in consultation with water experts throughout the country and uh, consultants, and we're looking at ways to clean the distribution main. Um, so that in itself won't be a, a quick fix, but it, it will be a shorter duration than the long-term solution, which will be adding additional treatment processes to the Petty Harbor Long Pond water treatment facility. Now at that news conference that was held just a short while ago, the city said it now has a total of four water stations open and the exact locations can be found on the city website. Coming up in a little over half an hour from now, Carolyn will speak live with Mayor Danny Breen to get the very latest. I've never seen as many musicians using it. Roughly two thirds of the people who come into the recovery center have used cocaine. If the trend is going to keep continuing on the upswing, I can't see anything good coming from it. Well, a woman from Fortune is living every parent's worst nightmare. She seeks answers in her son's death. Donna Foote Matthews believes her son died as a result of an attack outside a bar in Alberta, and the man who assaulted him is long gone. Ryan Cook reports. Jeff Matthews was loved by his mother, his friends, and his little girl. But he was taken from them in June, his mother believes, by one swing of a drunken fist. He's a good guy all the way around. We'll never get over his loss. We'll never, uh, never get over his loss. Matthews lived in Medicine Hat, a quiet city in southern Alberta. Just outside of town is CFB Suffield where British soldiers come to engage in war games. When the soldiers come into town, things can get rocky. Some bars made national news when they banned the Brits from their establishments. Jeff Matthews was at a downtown bar when he was approached by three soldiers. One allegedly became aggressive. He just hauled up and smacked Jeff one smack and sucker punched him and down he went. And through that, he ended up with a cracked skull and internal bleeding. And result of that he's not here anymore. Matthew survived the punch. He didn't go to hospital until the next day. An MRI showed his injuries but he went home that night rather than stay for observation. To me if he wanted to leave they should have notified the authorities or someone who had kept him there under observation letting him know that it was life-threatening and to leave there but they allowed him to leave for some reason and uh, that upsets me and the family as well. Matthews deteriorated the next day. He died the day after that on a Sunday. On Monday, the soldiers went back to the UK. If there was any DNA of my son on this soldier or any markings whatsoever of him smacking my son, it's, that would be covered and done now. So to me, that's very unfair, very unfair. But I will see justice served. I won't stop. Charges have yet to be laid. Police have to be sure Matthew's death was caused by the altercation. But his mother worries it's too late. Ryan Cook, CBC News, St. John's. A judge dismissed a charge of dangerous driving causing death against a St. John's man today. Brandon Quilty was driving this Corvette when it crashed on Blackhead Road in May of 2017. And his passenger, 27-year-old Justin Murrins, was ejected from the vehicle. He died two days later in hospital. Quilty was later charged in relation to Murrins' death, but according to court documents, a judge today decided there just was not enough evidence to take the case to trial. Well, a big change is coming to an already tricky-to-navigate intersection in the heart of St. John's. Rollins Cross is in the middle of a makeover that will see traffic lights taken down, one road closed, and yield signs just about everywhere. Here and now's Jeremy Eaton attended a technical briefing today to help us navigate the intersection's overhaul point that you enter the circle, you'll have to yield. The City of St. John's manager of transportation engineering walks through the changes. 
there's been uh, an experience of quite a bit of traffic collisions at those locations, uh, particular T-bone collisions, uh, which are quite dangerous and, and could injure somebody quite easily. Uh, so we wanted to see if we could do anything about that. According to City Hall, there were about 120 accidents over a six-year period at Rollins Cross. So the traffic lights, including the ones for pedestrians, are going. There's a new crosswalk on Monkstown Road, and Military Road between Rennie's Mill and Monkstown will be closed to regular traffic. The only exception is emergency crews. We've also narrowed up the road a little bit here, so all this yellow hatching uh, along the left um, is new. That didn't used to be there. Um, and as we continue down Monkstown towards the intersection at Military, there used to be three lanes there. Um, so there's two lanes now, and we're actually going to be placing some of these temporary traffic islands on either curb to, to narrow it in even further. The infamously interesting intersection to navigate is now a giant roundabout. Lots of new yield signs will be hung and painted on the road. Drivers' routines will have to change. This corner of Flavin will be, like, it'll no longer be accessible. It'll be enclosed in barriers. And so people coming up Flavin, like that vehicle just did, instead of kind of coming straight through and then coming to this kind of, like, three-way confluence here at weird angles, they're going to be coming up to uh, like it'll be enclosed with barriers and they'll be coming up at 90 degrees to Prescott. Like with any change it makes, the city says it will take time for people to adjust. But the city does firmly believe that the changes it's making here at Rollins Cross will make the intersection safer for not only drivers, but for pedestrians. However, people on social media, well, they're not convinced just yet. Now, if this pilot project does work, that's going to mean that drivers here are going to have to pay a lot more attention to the signs that are now posted. Jeremy Eaton, CBC News, St. John's. To provincial politics now, the New Democrats have chosen a candidate for the Windsor Lake by-election. Carrie Claire Neal beat Matt House at a nomination meeting last night. Neal addressed supporters after clinching that nomination, saying she looks forward to the next few weeks and to winning the seat in the House of Assembly. The by-election is set for September the 20th. Her opponents are Liberal candidate Paul Antle and Progressive Conservative leader Chess Crosby. And infighting in the provincial Liberal Party is flaring up again, this time between influential Cabinet Minister Andrew Parsons and outspoken MHA Colin Holloway. It's the latest chapter in the House of Assembly harassment scandal. Our Terry Roberts is once again on this story today. Colin Holloway, still stinging from an investigation that essentially dismissed his claims of harassment, took it on the chin once again today, this time right here from Cabinet Heavyweight Andrew Parsons. Holloway is the Parliamentary Secretary for Municipal Affairs. He says former Minister Eddie Joyce froze him out of all department activities. And since Joyce was ejected and Parsons took over the department, Holloway says the isolation has continued. Parsons wouldn't talk to me on camera, but this morning he told CBC Radio he was surprised by Holloway's claim. Said Holloway has been invited to meetings, but never shows up, and seems to have no interest other than issues happening in his own district. At no point did Mr. Holloway come and say, can I help or can I, what would you like me to do? Parsons then went further. I know that Mr. Holloway, by his own admission, has said he has issues with multiple people. So one would question, well, if you have so many issues, are you sure you want to be a part of that? Holloway was listening to Parsons' interview from his home in Port Blanford, and he quickly called in to counter what he says were completely false statements by the minister. Holloway said Parsons simply won't speak to him won't even respond to his emails. I've seen Mr. Parsons in the department when I've been there, certainly when the house has been open. I've um, greeted him or whatever, no acknowledgement. Holloway implies Parsons set him up for an ambush with the press. He was asked to deliver a speech on Parsons' behalf in St. John's on May 31st. When he arrived, reporters were waiting with a leaked copy of his harassment complaint to the Commissioner for Legislative Standards. I went to the Delta Hotel. It was a last-minute request from the minister's office for me to go do that. I, I guess cornered or I got approached by several media to talk about the letter that had been inappropriately provided to them about my letter of complaint that was supposed to be kept confidential. For his part, Parsons says there was no setup, just two events scheduled at the same time. A tough spot for Colin Holloway, but he's determined to stay a liberal, even though he thinks some in the party would like to see him go. Why should I because I'm trying to help change a culture. Why should I have to give up what I believe in? Terry Roberts, CBC News, St. John's. 
25 cats in just 24 hours. Last week, the St. John's Humane Society saw an influx of felines in need of homes. And as cute as they are, certain bias that I have, these cats, <laughs> well, they overran that shelter. But tonight, here now, Zach Gowdy has a happy update. Counselor, there's a lot of people here today, and uh, I gather you're adopting a lot of kitties. Yeah, it started uh, started Tuesday. We had some awareness. We had a lot of cats came in. At one point, there was 25 cats came in in a 24-hour period. So we had a bit of a, an outcry to the public saying, if you're interested in a cat. And then next thing we know, a gentleman showed up the next morning and donated $4,000 for the next number of cat adoptions. So basically, the next 29 cat adoptions starting was today were free. So, wow, do you know anything more about this person, this, this generous donor? Yeah. We're just calling him the anonymous man right now. It's not the first time he's donated. He donated last year as well. And it's just one of these uh, people that want to see the cats go to a good home. And some people can't always afford the $138, so it is a bit of a barrier for some people. But, you know, by coming in and doing this, he knows it's going to get more cats adopted. And it was on a go-forward basis, so it wasn't they didn't go back because those people already committed to the cat. So. Uh, it's great because that really uh, helped because at one point we had close to 100 cats here. So Wow. So this person, you know, th this donor, I mean, you said he's donated before, but do you think he heard this urgent appeal and, you know, went and withdrew a lot of money? Yeah, he said he'd, he's seen the, uh, the media support and, you know, that the media put it out there, that we had a call for people to get, you know, cats out there. And he came in and said, uh, you know, I want to help out and here's $4,000. So thank you if you're watching tonight, sir. <laughs> That's really fantastic. So what's it been like here now since the word got out that there was free cats available at the shelter? Well, normally it's not a too big of an issue for parking, but I mean, I had to park around the back of the building. The place has been bumping. A lot of smiles in here, a lot of kids, a lot of, uh, a lot of people in here getting cats. So it's great to see. They're great pets. I have a cat. I think you have a cat Absolutely. you had mentioned. Yeah. So there's been a lot of people around. The support's been great from the community. And this, you know, removing that barrier of the money certainly helps. And I believe we have about 67 cats left, which is certainly down from the near three figures we had which is great. And um, so we've adopted out, I believe, 83 since Tuesday, which is fantastic. That's really wonderful. Um, are all the free cats spoken for already? We're about halfway through the 29 right now. Um, by the end of the day today, we could be through the 29. So if there is anyone interested in watching tonight, come in here at noon tomorrow. Try not to call. Uh, the phones have been you know, going hot to hook out there and the ladies are busy getting the cats and the adoption papers done up. So come in at noon tomorrow and we'll see if we can't get you a cat. I wonder if I can handle another one at my house. What do you think? This guy's pretty friendly. I think you take this one home. Oh, buddy. Are you already adopted? Want to come home with Zach? I, I think you got a winner there. I'm not a teetotaler, but I, I wouldn't mind seeing more bar owners having zero tolerance for it. We speak with a musician about an uptick in cocaine use in the St. John's nightlife scene. What some bars are doing to curb the trend, coming up on Here and Now.
Welcome back to Here and Now. A musician is sounding the alarm on a popular drug, a powdery part of the St. John's nightlife scene, cocaine. She says she's seeing more people snorting the drug than ever before. Here and Now's Kate McGillivray examines what Eastern Health is seeing and what bars can do to curb the trend. Colleen Power has spent decades playing music in St. John's. She says in the last couple of years, cocaine use around her has skyrocketed. I've never seen as many musicians using it and as many, I guess, service industry workers as well, uh, people who out, are out in the bars in the nighttime. Power says the people she knows who are addicted end up out of money and wasting away. I think it's evident that there needs to be more support systems put in place. Um, I'm not a teetotaler, but I, I wouldn't mind seeing more bar owners having zero tolerance for it. One bar making an effort is Valhalla in downtown St. John's. If someone is dealing cocaine and I see it, we will escort them, tell them they have to leave. If someone appears to be under the influence of cocaine or MDMA or any kind of upper, we will give them um, lots of water. We'll make sure that, try to get a gauge of where they are. But Earl says other bars could be doing more. I think that we should all get together, have a huge meeting on what we can do to make it safer for everybody. Bars like this are doing what they can to stop people from dealing drugs. But it's hard to know what's in the drugs that people are sneaking in. Eastern Health says the biggest risk of cocaine use is that you never know what it's being cut with. We have people who um, are using primarily cocaine that they tell us who have overdosed. And when they've gone to the hospital, opiates has shown. Like Power, Singleton has seen a rise in cocaine use in the city over the last decade. She says that it used to be an anomaly for cocaine users to come in for treatment. Now, roughly two-thirds of the people who come into the recovery center have used cocaine, are using cocaine, or are coming in primarily for cocaine, which is really significant. So yes, there is a, there is a huge spike. Power said she felt compelled to speak out after seeing the impact of the drug on people around her. She wants people to know that cocaine is seriously addictive and could be cut with anything. If the trend is going to keep continuing on the upswing, I can't see anything good coming from it. Kate McGilvery, CBC News, St. John's. Back now to our top story. A U.S. trade tribunal overturned President Donald Trump's tariffs on Canadian newsprint today. And the provincial government fought hard against this punitive measure, spending at least $700,000 on legal costs. Now, those tariffs could have cost Cornerbrook Pulp and Paper an estimated $30 million a year. I met up with Premier Dwight Ball in his office to discuss today's news. Well, Premier Ball, uh, your reaction to the significance of today's decision? Well, it's a great day for the forestry industry in the province, uh, Anthony. It's been a year in the making, and we had the first announcement of tariffs in January this year. The first announcement was just under 10 percent. At one point in the last few months, it reached 36 percent. So it was a big impact, potential big impact on the forestry industry. And as you know, there's 5,000 people attached to the forestry industry in our province. So it's a significant day, a big win for the team. Today, seeing the uh, decision 5-0, and unanimous, coming out of the U.S. today, and the tariffs are removed. If, you, if I invite you to try to get in the mind of Donald Trump, which I'm not sure anyone wants to really do, but do you think the fact it was 5-zip would actually send a message to the White House? Well, this is, I think, the big message you know, to the White House. This is the second uh, you know, win for us in the forestry industry in our province in less than a year. The first one was, that didn't get a whole lot of discussion, was the exemption from the softwood lumber tariff. So that was a w the first win for us in the forestry industry. The second one is today. And the fact that the decision is 5-0, I think, sends a big message. But I think for us, uh, the message is that is when you work together, we work with the federal government, we work very closely to Kruger themselves with the unions in the, throughout the province. But more than that, it was about the publishing industry in the U.S., the governors that we knew in the U.S., the senators that we knew in the U.S. There was a full court press uh, to get this decision where it is today. So I think it's really about pushing back to Washington, telling our story in Newfoundland and Labrador, and indeed the story of the newsprint industry across the country. So it's a win for, uh, for Newfoundland and Labrador, but a big win for the country as well. You're certainly familiar with that part of the island on the West Coast. Uh, this is not just about Cornerbrook and the Pulton Paper Mill, it's about the whole region. Had these tariffs been left in place, what do you think the impact would have been? Uh, you know, I, we were discussing that this morning, and I did have a chat with Mr. Kruger uh, once the announcement came out. Today, I think the discussion would have been very different if those tariffs had stayed in place. I really do believe we would have been talking about mill closures. You're talking about 
tens of millions of dollars of cost to the industry in our province. And the domino impact of that would be the impact on the agriculture industry as well. But 5,000 jobs is what we're at stake, is what was at stake in this decision. So we're proud of the work that's been done, the way we've pushed back as a team. Uh, so today the story is a better, much better story than it could have been if the decision did not go our way. Yeah. We still have this rather unpredictable and somewhat popular president of the United States with certain quarters. Any concerns that now that he's done with wood and has lost that he might shift his focus to something like iron ore? Well, of course, there's a big meeting today in Washington around NAFTA, a big focus on big impact. It's still our biggest trading partner. It's the largest trading partnership relationship in the world. I don't think a lot of people that really, uh, most people don't see it that way, but Canada and U.S. has the largest trading partnership in the world. I know people south of the border value uh, Canadians. They value Newfoundlanders and Labradorians. They see that as well. I speak to them quite, uh, quite often. They see it. We see it. Right now we have a president that uh, uh, he doesn't see it quite like we do, but we're going to continue to work together, and, and hopefully uh, President Trump at some point will recognize, indeed, what this panel did recognize today, that the right decision was made, and indeed, the newsprint industry is in good shape. We need a similar decision to be made now on the much broader issue around NAFTA. Premier, thank you very much. Thank you. Mm. So, uh, things you were saying were going to get colder, and they're going to get colder, but not quite as mm -hmm. cold. Yeah, the wind is changing okay. overnight tonight. It's turning into a northerly wind, so it's going to be a fairly chilly overnight tonight. Uh, but then we're looking at slightly warmer temperatures okay. tomorrow, and then it cools down again. Let me just right. explain. <laughs> uh, so here's a look at the highs today. It was a great day on the island. Yet another great day. Some cooler temperatures for uh, parts of Labrador, though, particularly Makovic at 8 degrees there. So we do have a system working its way towards uh, the province overnight tonight. A few uh, showers for the east uh, in the next few hours, uh, but that should clear off overnight. So yes, we do have this system is going to bring a fairly significant amount of rain uh, to the island tomorrow. So we won't really start to see that until tomorrow morning. Uh, so the overnight lows tonight, as I mentioned, you can see we have a northerly wind, fairly strong as well and temperatures on the island dipping down to between 10 and 11 degrees 13 on the west so it is going to be a cool night you can see the showers there in corner brook that's for early tomorrow morning when that system starts to move in and as well for lab city tomorrow morning could start to see some showers from that system so tomorrow morning when you wake up uh, st john's looking at a mix of sun and cloud and 11 degrees there so a mix of sun and cloud for the east clouding over in central areas as that system starts to move in uh, a bit showery there in the west and uh, in the northern areas and uh, cloudy there for western Labrador tomorrow morning. So yeah, you can see the temperatures here not great throughout the day tomorrow. Lots of rain uh, starting in the west and tracking east won't hit uh, the east until tomorrow night really. But temperatures getting up to about 21 degrees but cooler in those uh, onshore winds around 17 degrees uh, by the shore there. So as we move to central, that's really where the most rain will hit. Grand Falls, Windsor, uh, Twillingate looking at about 10 to 15 millimeters of rain. Terra Nova, not quite as much, two millimeters there and temperatures much cooler than they've been. 17 degrees as the high tomorrow. 10 to 15 millimeters of rain throughout the day tomorrow for the Cornerbrook, Grossmourne area and up along the northern peninsula. Lancelou looking at about five to 10 millimeters of rain and uh, yeah, temperatures Temperatures fairly cool uh, in Labrador for tomorrow. A chance of showers for Lab City and as well for Happy Valley Goose Bay. And uh, as I mentioned, the Avalon Peninsula really won't start to see some of those showers until tomorrow night. I'll have those details coming up a bit later. I don't know if it's just me or if, if it's like this for everyone. Boat racing just calms me down and just lets me be me and do whatever I want. Eastbound and down to race. Meet a St. John's teen who is not letting a learning setback slow him down.
Welcome back. A teenager from St. John's is not letting his learning disability slow him down. In fact, it's fueling him forward. Michael Neary, number 23, races at Eastbound Speedway in Avondale. The sport has also taken him to the United States. But it's not just a need for speed. Neary is also raising money to support a group that has supported him, the Learning Disabilities Association in this province. And we're going to hear from them shortly. But first, meet Michael. Hi, my name is Michael Neary. I live in Portugal Cove and I drive race cars. I started racing when I was 15, 14 years old at a go-kart track uh, up in Torbay. Just growing up, my family and everyone around me, I always loved racing and watched it a lot. So naturally, I always started watching it and I just went forward a bit more and I just ended up progressing to racing at Eastbound in the Legend Car Series. Everyone always looks at racing as like adrenaline sport. I mean, just something that people do just to get the adrenaline rush and drive something fast and go for it. But the weird thing, I don't know if it's just me or if, if it's like this for everyone, but racing just calms me down and just lets me be me and do whatever I want. So growing up in elementary school, I could never really read or write for that matter and just not good at school in general and finally in grade two I think it was uh, my teacher mentioned to my parents that I might have a learning disability and I ended up getting diagnosed that year with a whole load of different ones that it's all write, reading and writing based and then in grade four or five someone else mentioned to us about the learning disabilities that it might help me not actually learn how to read but help me cope with not being able to read and how to fix that part of the issue. When I started racing, it's always nice to have a reason to race and a reason to go back to the track. So we decided to give back to someone that helped me out a lot and helped my family out a lot in our lives. We got the name on the car and, and also my mom and my sister sell race programs, little pamphlets that have all the current point standings and just introducing people to racing and letting people know what's happening on the track. So they sell those out to the track every race day for $2. And last year was the year that we started that and we raised $1,500 and gave it all to them. Having a learning disability, obviously you can knock down like the confidence level of yourself. Like, it's like, well, I can't do this because I can't read or I can't do that because I can't write or because my speech is a bit off, I can't do this. But racing gives me the confidence to say I can do something that I put my mind to and I can do this and I can succeed at what I want. Well, Michael says he has confidence in large part thanks to the Learning Disability Association. Lynn, uh, he's quite the guy. He certainly is and we're so proud of him that he was kind and thoughtful and wants to give back to the Learning Disability Association. The money is donated will certainly help those with learning disabilities. Yeah, and he certainly proudly puts your logo on his race car. How many young people are like him in our province? Uh, the national statistics are 1 in 10, so uh, the same would go for Newfoundland and Labrador. Now, he pointed out, as he was sort of telling a story, that when he was a kid, he didn't realize until really grade 2 that he really had a hard time reading mm -hmm. and, and writing. Any advice you have as we head back to school? Some parents may know their children have a learning disability, some may not know. What advice do you have for them? Uh, the biggest advice I can give is to trust your gut. If you know something's not quite right, uh, you're probably right, and you should seek out the advice of our association. Look up information about learning disabilities, seek expert advice, and particularly go to your school and talk to the teacher and the guidance counselor. Right. Now, how did you get involved with learning disabilities? Uh, my youngest daughter, who's now a grown adult, uh, she had severe learning disabilities, and it was a long time to get her diagnosed. And again, I trusted my gut, and I fought and fought until we finally got her diagnosed, mm -hmm. and she got the support she needed right. to finish school. And may I ask what the nature of her disability was? Um, so it was sort of global, uh, dyslexia, reading issues, and uh, uh, auditory processing, and attention deficit, which often goes along with learning disabilities, right. made it kind of complicated. Yeah, some some people sort of they've heard of learning disability and. Um, they don't always re realize that sometimes these co-present, right? So you can have more yes. than one, which makes things more complicated. Exactly. And sometimes you get comorbidity with mental health issues as well. So as far as what can be provided for people uh, as parents sort of enter going back to school, what, what is out there for people? 
Well, our association offers support. We do advocacy work. Uh, we have an after-school tutoring program, especially with children who have phonemic awareness issues and math problems. Um, the other thing is just to seek uh, help and get tutoring sometimes is needed for, uh, and get an assessment. That's a big thing right. to try to get an early assessment so that you can get the supports you need. Do most parents, do you think, understand that if their child is assessed uh, and is determined to have a learning disability that the school district will make accommodations and modifications for them as they try to go through the school year? You have to become, as a parent, a strong advocate. Yes, you should get the uh, supports you need and the uh, accommodations you need, but sometimes it doesn't always happen. Unfortunately, even today, our teachers don't always have the uh, education that they need to really recognize learning disabilities and know how to accommodate. It's getting a lot better than it was, but we still have a long way to go. So as a parent, you still have to be on top of things and make sure your child is getting the accommodation they need. All right, well, listen, appreciate your time, and uh, good luck as we head into this school year. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, and thanks again to Michael. Not think twice about the water coming out of your taps, but here in the Wapakek First Nation, they're certainly not taking this for granted. While thousands of people in parts of St. John's are fetching clean water, officials in Con River are celebrating a milestone. The community has lifted a four-year boil water order, thanks in part to millions in upgrades at the water treatment plant. Here now is Garrett Barry was in that community and got a tour of the plant. They've got gauges, pipes, filters, working hard. We require approximately uh, 300,000 liters per day. First through these filters, then into the membranes and finally into the UV system. Basically, uh, in, in a sealed chamber, and uh, the water passes over the light and gets disinfected. All the while, workers check the chlorine and the haziness. So after all that testing and all that treatment, the water comes out of taps just like this, looking crystal clear. It's come a long way. I'd say probably 50% of the time. Uh, we've been on boil water advisory since 2004. Built in 2004, this plant has had its share of issues. The coating that was on the wall seems to be uh, deteriorating. Um, the tank was never separated so that we can close one side down to clean it and still have water. So there's many, many issues. It was done, fixed, and then 
put back online only a short space of time, um, and then be taken off and go back onto a ball order. Now, the community is getting new water lines. The plant has its new UV filter, and the boil water advisory has been lifted. Most, most people have noticed a difference in the quality of water and, uh, and are, are drinking water from the taps again. Still, after years of advisories, some are cautious. It takes a long time to, to gain confidence back, but it don't, doesn't take very long to lose it. Yeah. Well, I've only heard a few people say it's about time. Uh, well, you know, it's, uh, people have been waiting and waiting all those years, so don't blame them. It's about time, it's long overdue. Uh, how long is it going to last? Uh, are we going to shut down again? The chief says he doesn't have all the answers, but he's confident. We could only hope that uh, the plant is up and running, and once we fix all the, the water lines, it'll, it'll be good for a long, long time to come. Garrick Berry, CBC News, in the Miabogek First Nation. But in the west end of St. John's, many are still under a water warning tonight. Yesterday, the city announced a manganese problem in the Petty Harbor Long Pond water system. Elevated levels of the metal could cause potential neurological issues when consumed in excess. St. John's Mayor Danny Breen joins us now live with an update. So, Mayor Breen, what is the latest on the situation? Well, our staff continue to work through the uh, the issue, uh, working with uh, with consultants to determine uh, what the proper course of action is to uh, remediate the problem. Uh, we've also uh, taken some of the questions that have been raised by the public since we made the announcement uh, yesterday and gave the notification. Uh, one of the issues that was raised was uh, whether the uh, water. Uh, if it's running clear, was safe to drink. And uh, we've been able today to have further discussions with Health Canada and with Eastern Health. And uh, we are now uh, able to reiterate what we said yesterday, that if the water is running clear, it is safe to drink. If the water is, uh, is colored, uh, then we would suggest you identify another drinking water source uh, to use in place of that. So about 10,000 residents are affected by this. How concerned should people be? Well, you know, for, from any time you're dealing with the water supply, which the integrity of the water supply system uh, in, in any community is, uh, is of vital importance. So we're always concerned. That's why we do a, a, an amount of checking and testing um, on regularly on, on the water supplies. Uh, with this issue, uh, there is no uh, major health uh, concern uh, with, uh, with the water supply if it's running clear. There's a potential, as you said earlier, of excessive use of the colored water. But to be on, if water is discolored, but to be on the safe side, uh, staying away from the water when it's discolored, uh, then, uh, then uh, everything uh, should be fine. And uh, we have opened up four water stations uh, in the city to provide uh, drinking water to people who are in that situation and need, uh, and need water. And as well for those who uh, have um, are not able to get out of their homes or have other challenges, uh, we're putting in place a process that we should be ready to start in the morning uh, with addressing their concerns. So when did the city discover that there were elevated levels of magne magnes? From time to time, we receive uh, uh, comments and complaints from residents or just pointing out that water is discolored. Uh, usually there's a protocol that, the, that our staff go through in, in doing that. Uh, they went through that, but uh, early August we began noticing that it was uh, happening in, in different patterns. Uh, we did some further testing and uh, it was very difficult to track down because in many cases it would start and stop. So you'd see a discoloring, the discoloring would clear, it would go on for a while, then it would start again. So uh, we finally uh, we were able to track it down, uh, you know, yesterday or Monday uh, with regards to what the definite, uh, what we believe the definite cause is of this. And uh, immediately we uh, issued a notification to the residents. So what is the city going to do to fix this problem and when do you think it'll be fixed? Well, really there's a short term fix and a long term fix. The short term fix uh, is that we're working now with uh, consultants on the best way to clean the uh, transmission system. So the water transition sy transmission system uh, would, uh, would need to be cleaned and that's a, uh, that's a project that first of all we have to uh, 
work with the consultants to identify the best way to do that. It's not a simple operation. It's, it's, it's very complex and, uh, and one that requires some planning. In the long term, we'll be looking at, uh, at developing uh, further filtration systems at Petty Harbor Long Tom uh, to, uh, to address this issue. And, uh, and, and as well, over that time, this problem may in fact dissipate uh, as, as weather changes and as the, uh, the water in the, in the pond turns over. So uh, it's really uh, one, of those, one of those issues that, that we're gonna continue to, to work hard on. I can't give you a definite time of when we be completed, uh, but, uh, but we're certainly working hard at it now and identifying a plan to do so. All right, Mayor Danny Breen, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thank you, Carolyn. That's the view of downtown St. John's from our room's harbor cam. A few clouds there. Carolyn will have more weather details. It's next. Okay, so a lot of people still looking forward to uh, what the week holds. It's yes. been such a fantastic time of and late. And the long weekend. Of course, yeah. Because we do have a long That's weekend right. this weekend. Yeah. Yes. And you know what, things are looking pretty good so far. Let's get right to it, okay. shall we? We're going to start with uh, some of the rain that's going to be moving in uh, tonight into tomorrow. Mostly uh, the western portion and uh, central parts of the island going to be affected by uh, the showers tomorrow. About 10 to 15 millimeters for the Gander area, 5 to 10 for uh, Corner Brook and uh, the northern part of the island. And temperatures not too bad in the east, 21 degrees as, uh, as the high, but it's going to feel a bit cooler if you're along the coast. 17 degrees for central areas. And uh, you know what? It may be raining tomorrow, but we kind of need the rain right now because it has been a while. We need a good dose of water for all of the plants for sure. In Labrador, we're looking at a chance of showers throughout the day for the west and for Happy Valley Goose Bay. And uh, temperatures in the between 10 and 15 degrees for the big land tomorrow. So as I mentioned earlier in the show, the east really won't be seeing much of 
the showers until uh, later Thursday night into Friday morning. That's when the St. John's area should start to see some uh, showers and then things start to clear off for the island and for Labrador. So Friday looking pretty good. A mix of sun and cloud for pretty much everyone. Temperatures still uh, in that mid teens to upper teens uh, range. Cloudy skies uh, for the east and 16 degrees as the high there. So now we're getting into Saturday and yes, things are looking pretty good. Nice and clear on the island. Some cool air though. The wind is going to be a little bit chilly and we do have this system that will be moving into Labrador on Sunday. So this is the picture for Saturday afternoon. Pretty much everyone is going to get a taste of sunshine on Saturday, which is just great. Labrador looking like the place to be in terms of temperatures on the island. 19 degrees as the high for the west and east. Cooler in the in the east, 16 degrees. So here's a snapshot of the long weekend, Saturday, Sunday, Monday. So for St. John's in the city and the Buren Peninsula, temperatures on Saturday and Sunday around the mid to upper teens, sun and cloud. For Monday, though, it boosts up a little bit more. For uh, central areas and the west, temperatures not too bad, 19, 20 degrees on Saturday and Sunday, and a chance of some showers on a Monday, the holiday. So for Labrador Labor Day weekend, uh, for the northern peninsula and the southeastern portion of uh, Labrador, temperatures 17 degrees right across the board for the uh, long weekend and the 20 degree mark for uh, most of the rest of Labrador. That's your forecast. Anthony, back to you. Thanks, Carolyn. A security breach may have compromised the important personal information of as many as 20,000 Air Canada customers. Today, the airline started notifying users about the breach. Air Canada says passengers' names and phone numbers may have been improperly accessed. Passport numbers, dates of birth, and other personal information could also have been compromised if they were saved to a user's profile. The airline says credit card information is encrypted and would be protected from a breach. Customers who may have been affected are being notified by email. Here's today's viewer photo of the day. Cotroy Valley. No? Uh, yes. Close. close. Very close. It's in the west, not quite there. Uh, okay. I'll, I'll let you know where this was taken after the break. It's gorgeous.
Welcome back to Here and Now. Well, police in Rivers, Manitoba have pulled off a pretty unique rescue mission. Yeah, I can certainly say that. They got a call about a litter of puppies that were stuck deep within a tunnel system. So the officers dug around and eventually found all five precious oh, dogs. I can hear your voice going up, Carolyn. Oh Where's goodness. the aww? Oh. They've all been to the vet now and they had some food and some rest too. No word yet though on how they got down into those tunnels in the first place. Oh. Yep, yeah. oh. cute little puppies. Sweet. There they are with the rescuers. So glad they're safe. All right, well, after Zach's item on cats, the dogs demanded equal time, so <laughs> of there they go. <laughs> Beautiful. You're a cat person, I'm a dog person. Oh, well, I like them both, but <laughs> cats. All right, so here's a look at our viewer photo of the day. Yes, a few guesses of where this was taken. Actually, uh, just west of Portobello. Okay. I was in the right direction. So, yeah, you definitely were. Grand Bay West, Brady Hines uh, sent this in to us um, in our email address, yeah. nlphotos at cbc.ca. Yeah, you don't see that kind of meadowy pasture in too many parts of the island. No. So I've seen it in the Codroy Valley and out there, but that's, that's really gorgeous. Yeah, love this one. We get so many sunsets and ocean mm. views, and this is a nice Wouldn't nice want ocean. to mow it, however, no. <laughs> to be honest. <laughs> Gotta get goats, sir. Yeah, yeah that's <laughs> right. We need some livestock it. for that. <laughs> All right, well, that's it for us. It is, yeah. And if you have a picture you'd like to send to us, of course, you can always send them to, what's the details? NLphotos at cbc.ca. All right, Send perfect. us what you have. Yep. Love to see it. <laughs> Especially the summer we've had, you know, connecting yeah. with the weather. Carol will get them on. Mm -hmm. And uh, we should arrange a contest before we get the whole that's summer over. That's a great over. idea, yeah. actually. And anyway, tune in tomorrow. We'll figure out a contest <laughs> once we get permission. And swag. <laughs> anyway, have a great night, and we'll see you tomorrow. Good night.